Psalm 88. O Lord, God of my salvation, I cry out day and night before you. Let my prayer come before you. Incline your ear to my cry. For my soul is full of troubles and my life draws near to Sheol. I am counted among those who go down to the pit. I am a man who has no strength, like one set loose among the dead, like the slain that lie in the grave, like those whom you remember no more, for they are cut off from your hand. You have put me in the depths of the pit, in the regions of dark and deep. Your wrath lies heavy upon me, and you overwhelm me with your waves. You have caused my companions to shun me. You have made me a horror to them. I am shut in so that I cannot escape. My eyes grow dim through sorrow. Every day I call upon you, O Lord. I spread out my hands to you. Do you work wonders for the dead? Do the departed rise up to praise you? Is your steadfast love declared in the grave or your faithfulness in Abaddon? Are your wonders known in the darkness or your righteous in the land of forgetfulness? But I, O oh Lord, cry out to you. In the morning my prayer comes before you. O oh Lord, why do you cast my soul away? Why do you hide your face from me? Afflicted and close to death from my youth up, I suffer your terrors. I am helpless. Your wrath has swept over me. Your dreadful assaults destroy me. They surround me like blood all day long. They close in on me together. You have caused my beloved and my friend to shun me. My companions have become darkness. You know, if this psalm was a picture and... Uh, if it could be posted on Instagram, it would never be posted on Instagram. Because this is not the kind of story we want to tell people publicly. These are not the kind of feelings we want people to see. This would never make it on Instagram. It's too real. And you think about where we are with the pandemic right now, things seem to be opening up. Right? Things seem to be opening up and uh, it's safe to meet in homes. We've had people over. Uh, we've uh, we've been able to go to people's homes, uh, and it, there's a temptation to think that there's a straight way out of the pandemic. There's a linear way out of the pandemic, that it's behind us, and we can just forget about it and move on. Uh, but I just want to warn us that there's no straight way out of the pandemic. It might be actually a long and winding road, where uh, it may be more cyclical. That every now and then, every now and again, you might find yourself feeling the way that the psalmist is feeling. And that's, that shouldn't be surprising. So the question I want to ask today is how can we keep going ahead after what's gone behind us? How can we keep going ahead after what's gone behind us? And there's, there's two kinds of postures in Christianity that we must resist. We must resist this kind of Salman Khan, Rajnikanth Christianity. Where, you know, you see Rajnikanth walking out and there's a huge explosion behind him and he's just walking out shades on all and not a scratch on him and bragging about it. Like, I came out unscathed. Nothing's, nothing will happen. So you have, you have to resist that kind of Christianity because that kind of Christianity mocks your tears. It mocks your weakness. It looks down on you. But equally, we must resist this kind of sob story Christianity. My mother used to call some Bollywood movies tear jerkers because they were designed to make you cry and designed to make you fall in love with your tears. And we must resist that kind of sob story Christianity. It worships our tears. You know, but what we need, what we need, we must embrace a kind of sublime Christianity. And I love the word sublime. When it, when it refers to a person, it refers to a, a person's attitude or behavior that is extreme or unparalleled. It's unparalleled. And that's what you see in this psalm. You see the posture of a person, an attitude and a behavior that is extreme and unparalleled. Because it values our tears, but it also knows the one who can wipe away our tears. And this is one of the saddest psalms in the entire book of Psalms. It's one of the things that has the faintest glimmer of hope. 
the faintest glimmer of hope. In fact, you, you won't even uh, catch it on the first reading. It's that, it's so subtle. But even as we go out of what, what seems like the worst was behind us, even as we go ahead, I want us to remember there's no straight way out of the pandemic. There's a long and winding road. Sometimes you might find yourself over and over again, uh, feeling like you're taking one step forward and two steps back. So I want us to be doing three things constantly. I want us to be doing three things constantly. I want us to be recognizing, I want us to be receiving, and I want us to be remembering. So first of all, to be recognizing. I want you to read what, I want you to hear what the psalmist says. He says, Lord, you are the God who saves me. Day and night I cry out to you. May my prayer come before you. Turn your ear to my cry. Now listen to this. I am overwhelmed with troubles and my life draws near to death. I am counted among those who go down to the pit. I am like one without strength. I am set apart with the dead, like the slain who lie in the grave, whom you remember no more, who are cut off from your care. You have put me in the lowest pit, in the darkest depths, your wrath lies heavily on me. You have overwhelmed me with all your waves. You have taken from me my closest friends and have made me repulsive to them. I am confined and cannot escape. My eyes are dim with grief. I call to you, Lord, every day. I spread out my hands to you. Do you think, help me out with something. Is he being spiritual? Is this man being spiritual? When he says to God, I am like one without strength. I am like one without strength. And I, want you to, I want you to know a little bit about this person. This is a, a person named Heman. He is the founder of a choir called the Sons of Korah. He was appointed by David to lead the singing in the house of God. He is described in 1 Kings as wiser than all men. And his fame spread throughout the surrounding region. He is wise and famous. It's a rare combination. Either you are wise and not famous or you are famous and a fool. But to be wise and famous, this is something else entirely. He's wise and famous. And he's a songwriter. I am like one without strength. No one in Delhi likes to say this. You'll never find someone in Delhi saying, I am like one without strength. And, that, and what he's, he's recognizing is that he's emotionally, mentally, psychologically weak. But while he's recognizing that, one thing is for sure, he is not unspiritual. You know, how comforting to know that a prayer like this is in the Bible that the spectrum of spirituality in the Bible has room for feeling like this without feeling like you're letting God down without feeling that you're not being strong see because in the Bible because it, it, think it takes enormous strength to tell someone that you're feeling weak it takes enormous strength to tell someone that you're feeling weak. In Delhi, we, we won't do this. See, weakness is not sin. In your weakness, you may sin. But weakness itself is not sin. And, and real strength is not in, in, in being strong. It's in knowing where your strength comes from. And knowing where your strength comes from. And how good to know that God is strong enough to bear with your weakness. How good to know that God is strong enough to bear with your weakness. I am like one without strength. If you haven't if you don't feel like this now, just wait for it. It's coming. The day is coming. When you will be when you will feel this way and you'll be tempted to think I'm not being spiritual and I want you to rebuke yourself when you, when you feel that way and I want you to remember this psalm 
I am like one without strength. Now, what does this weakness look like? The weakness that he's describing here is the weakness of the mind and uh, his emotions, his 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 thoughts. Uh, psychologically, he's weak. You know, and and uh, this is a kind of despair that he's feeling. He's he's in a despairing state, and despair is like a fever of the mind. It's a fever of the mind. See, when you have a fever in your body, your body becomes weak. And all the things that you could do earlier, you can't do anymore. And a fever will always expose how fragile the body is. And despair is like that. It's a fever of the mind. All the things that you could think, all the things that you could feel, you can't do them anymore. And just like when you have a high fever, you get delirious. When you have high despair, you get delirious too. And look at what, so I want you to know how to recognize when you're despairing. Because despair will, despair is like a magnifying glass. It's like a magnifying glass. It just magnifies everything. Whatever you're feeling gets magnified. Whatever you're afraid of gets magnified. Everything gets magnified. So in despair, you feel, in, in despair, living feels like dying. Living feels like dying. Your friends feel like they're your enemies. Everything that's true feels like it's a lie. And it's magnified. In despair, everything that's true not only feels like a lie, everything that's a lie feel like, feels like it's the truth. And when you see that happening, you've got to recognize, I, I, I'm in despair. I'm in despair. In despair, we, we, we trust ourselves more than we question ourselves. Whatever we feel, we'll just trust it. We won't question it. And I want you to see what he's saying. See, he, 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 it's not just uh, that he's feeling alone, that he's feeling abandoned. It's one thing to feel alone. That's, that's despairing enough. But he's also feeling abandoned. You have put me in the lowest pit, in the darkest depths. He's feeling abandoned. And he's not just in a pit, he's in the lowest pit. He's not just in the depths, he's in the darkest depths. Because everything is magnified. Everything in despair gets magnified. It's like in another psalm where David says, In my despair I said, all men are liars. All men are liars. One person lied. But all men are liars. That's what despair does. It magnifies. So when you, And this is how you recognize your weakness. And you shouldn't be surprised when this happens. This is a, you, you should expect that some days like this will happen after a pandemic after what's gone behind us, that we'll have days like this. We have to recognize that's what's happening. But we don't only really recognize our weakness, I want you to recognize strength. It's fascinating what he does in this psalm. It's just fascinating what he's doing. Because he begins the psalm by saying, Lord, you are the God who saves me. I would begin by saying, Lord, you are the one who curses me. Lord, you are the God who saves me. Day and night, day and night, I cry out to you. Day and night, I cry out to you. Who does that? Chill. Look at the psalm. Look at what he says. He says, you have put me in the lowest pit, in the darkest depths. Your wrath lies heavily on me. You have overwhelmed me with all your waves. You have taken from me my closest friends and have made me repulsive to them. I am confined and cannot escape. My eyes are dim with grief. I call to you, Lord, every day. Why is he returning to the person that he holds responsible for how he's feeling? He holds God responsible for how he's feeling. But he returns to him. And, and, and look look what he says. Why, Lord, do you reject me and hide your face from me? You know, you know what he's doing? He's putting his trust in God the way poor people put their trust in doctors. So when a poor person has a fever and when they have COVID symptoms, you'll see them lining up outside the hospital. They have no hope apart from these doctors. They're desperate. 
but we're middle class. We'll, we'll never do this. We'll never turn back. We'll never put our trust in God the way poor people trust in doctors because we're privileged, we're powerful. We have options. We have ways to appease ourselves. We don't need to be desperate. And we certainly won't return to the person whom we hold responsible for how we're feeling. But the psalmist, he's desperate. He knows, he knows, if I don't have you, what do I have? If I can't turn to you, where, where will I turn to? To whom will I go? And I want you to see, he, he, he recognizes his strength because he's, he's returning to the one whom he feels has rejected him. He's returning to the one to whom he feels is rejecting him. In Delhi, we'll never do this. In Delhi, we have like this spidey, spidey sense. You know how spider, Spider-Man has a spidey sense for any trouble? We have a spidey sense for rejection. If somebody's rejecting us, we'll reject immediately before they can reject us. Before you reject me, I'll reject you. We have a spidey sense for rejection. The moment we feel rejected, we reject first. If we feel rejected a little, this much, we'll reject this much. We will never return to the one who rejected us. That's not what we do in Delhi. I won't let you have power over me. That's Delhi. But here is this psalmist. This is sublime. Remember sublime. It's a, it's a, it's a person's attitude or behavior that's extreme, unparalleled. He returns to the one whom he holds responsible for how he's feeling. He returns to the one whom he feels is rejecting him because he knows that's where his strength comes from. You are the God who saves me. Day and night, I cry out to you. I call to you, Lord, every day. I spread out my hands to you. And the, fun, the funny thing is, you know, here's a person who feels rejected. And yet, this psalm is in the Bible. This is... God's word far from being rejected it's been received and God has put his seal of approval on it this is my word so the psalmist's words in the deepest depths of despair have not been rejected they've been received it's not weakness to feel weak it's weakness to pretend you're strong when you're weak. That's real weakness. And what good news that we can have days when we can say to God, I am like one without strength and be no less spiritual. Because there's room in the Bible for it. But what good news to know that when we say that we are not weak, we may actually be strong. So be recognizing be, be recognized. It's just like the way you know we are we are hypersensitive to our symptoms of fever in these days. The more, slightest cold, the slightest rise in temperature, and we are sensitive. Have I got COVID? Have I got COVID? Have I, we, we we are in that. We have to be that sensitive to the fever of the mind. Are my fears being magnified? Is the truth feeling like a lie? Is the lie feeling like a truth? My Am I, am, I, am I giving into feelings of being abandoned? Is everything bad getting worse because of the fever of the mind? Be recognizing it. Be recognizing that despair can happen to us. And be recognizing that it's okay to be weak and it's good to, to, to return to God for, to, to, know, to, to know that He's our strength. But the second thing I want us to be doing is to be receiving. Is to be receiving. Look what he says. He says, You have put me in the lowest pit, into the dark, into the, in the darkest depths. Your wrath lies heavily on me. You have overwhelmed me with all your waves. You have taken from me my closest friends and have made me repulsive to them. I am confined and cannot escape. My eyes are dim with grief. Verse 14, Why, Lord, do you reject me and hide your face from me? From my youth I have suffered and been close to death. I have borne your terrors and I am in despair. Your wrath has swept over me. 
your terrors have destroyed me. All day long they surround me like a flood, they have completely engulfed me. You have taken me, you have taken from me friend and neighbor. Darkness is my closest friend. He's recognizing this is God's doing and he's receiving it. He's receiving it, he's not rejecting it, he's receiving it. And then what he's doing is he's receiving God's discipline. He's receiving God's discipline. Nobody likes the word discipline. See, when I think of the word discipline, I think of my 11th standard maths teacher, who when he got angry would uh, shake his fists like this and point at uh, someone in the class and say, your brain is like the brain of a municipality toilet. It should be sent to California for research. No one, no one likes the word wrath. He never said that to me. Maybe he did. I've, I've uh, conveniently forgotten it. But no one likes the word wrath either. You know, when I, when I think of wrath, I think about my friend uh, from lo a long time ago whose father was a Christian preacher, evangelist, church goer, who would beat him with a belt, drag him across the floor with his hair. That's what people think of when they think of discipline and wrath. But the scripture says the Lord disciplines those he loves. The Lord disciplines those he loves. And this God's discipline does two things. It kills something in us and it builds something in us. It builds something in us and it kills something in us. God's discipline is God's way of creating self-control in us. When you're at a restaurant and you see a family and you see the kids misbehaving, very young kids misbehaving, whom are you upset with? Are you upset with the kids? Are you upset with the parents because they're not doing anything? Why aren't they doing anything? They should be doing something. See, the Lord disciplines those He loves. He does something. And discipline is God's way of creating self-control in us. See, discipline, that is, in India, if you've gone to school, you've seen someone try to discipline you without any discipline in themselves. You've seen people try to discipline you without any self-control, thinking that it's going to create self-control in you. See, discipline without self-control destroys self-control. Anger begets anger. When discipline is exercised without self-control, it creates more, it, it destroys self-control, it doesn't create self-control. Anger begets anger. But discipline with self-control, it creates self-control. Love begets love. And those who are disciplined by God's love, they know God's love, they actually respond to it, they receive it. That's what the psalmist is doing, he's receiving discipline. And you know what, you know the thing about discipline, right? We trust people who are disciplined. We don't trust people who are not disciplined. Which Uber driver will you give a five-star rating to? Will it be the one where you call him ten times and he's like, I've arrived at the location and you're, he's nowhere near the location. And when you finally get into the car, he's got alcohol on his breath, he's zooming to traffic, you tell him to put the AC on and he puts the fan on up, or to, uh, up and quietly, secretly puts it back down. Which, which Uber driver will you give a five-star rating to? Or, will you, or, or does the Uber driver who gets a five-star rating, the kind of driver who shows up at your location faster than you expected, says, I'm here, the car is clean, there's no alcohol in his breath, he drives properly, he does what he says he'll do. Because he's disciplined. We don't trust people who are not disciplined. And God disciplines this, this one. Because look at what he says. He says, verse, verse, verse 10 onwards. Do you show your wonders to the dead? Do their spirits rise up and praise you? Is your love declared in the grave? Your faithfulness and destruction? Are your wonders known in the place of darkness? Or your righteous deeds in the land of oblivion? See, he knows that he needs to be alive 
to declare God's wonders. He needs to be alive to declare God's love. And God is building in him through this the capacity to do that. When you're suffering, you know, you're more likely to trust someone who has suffered and who has suffered well. It's very, uh, very unlikely to trust people who haven't suffered or who have suffered badly. And God, the Lord's discipline does that. It builds in us resilience. It builds in us faith. It builds in us character. It builds in us self-control. And he's receiving it. But he's also receiving God's discipline. And God's discipline it is also something that kills something in us. He's receiving this experience as God's discipline and he's offering himself to it. He's not resisting it. And you know, just like a fever, you know, a fever is the body's way of protecting itself against a virus. It's a, vi a fever raises the body's temperature to create an inhospitable environment for any outside virus to survive. It's what a fever is doing. It's a, a fever is protecting you. And what if in despair, God is creating the conditions to kill something in you before it, kill, before it kills you? What if he's trying to kill your self-reliance that says, I don't need any help, I can do this on my own. I don't need any help, I can do this on my own. What if he's trying to kill that reliance, that self-reliance? What if he's trying to kill the urge to run? I need help, but I don't want your help. I need help, but I don't want your help. I'll find other help. What if he's trying to kill that? What if he's trying to kill rebellion? I will not do what you want me to do. I won't do it. I won't do what people say. I won't do what your word says. I won't do what my conscience says. I'll do what I want to do. What if he's trying to kill that? Discipline is God's way of killing something in us before it kills us. And that's what he's doing. So, so be receiving. If you're going through something that's despairing, ask the tough questions. What are you trying to build in me? What are you trying to kill in me? And finally, the only way we can do any of this is if we are remembering, be remembering. Be remembering that there is someone else who has felt like this. That there is someone greater than the psalmist who has prayed like this, who has suffered like this. Be remembering this same psalm through the, through the, in the voice of Jesus. He might as well be saying, I am overwhelmed with troubles and my life draws near to death. I am counted among those who go down to the pit. I am like one without strength. I am set apart with the dead, like the slain who lie in the grave, whom you remember no more, who are cut off from your care. Jesus himself may well be saying, you have put me in the lowest pit, in the darkest depths. Your wrath lies heavily on me. You have overwhelmed me with all your waves. You have taken from me my closest friends and have made me repulsive to them. I am confined and cannot escape. My eyes are dim with grief. Jesus himself might be saying, why Lord, do you reject me or hide your face from me? From my youth I have suffered and been close to death. I have borne your terrors and I am in despair. Your wrath has swept over me. Your terrors have destroyed me. All day long they surround me like a flood. They have completely engulfed me. You have taken from me my friend and neighbor. Darkness is my closest friend. You know, it's important to recognize Jesus is the king of majesty, but he's also the king of misery. He's also the king of misery. I remember the song by the police a long time ago called King of Pain. And I love this song, but I want to say to Sting, as much as I love you, you're not the king of pain. 
Jesus is the king of pain. He is the king of misery and is the king of pain. No one can understand this more than he can. Because see, the thing about despair is that the psalmist is experiencing feelings of despair. But Jesus experienced real despair. Because Jesus was actually forsaken. He didn't just feel forsaken. He was forsaken. And there's, it's important to remember that when you think about weakness in Jesus, Jesus is the one who is most strong and he became most weak so that those who are most weak can become most strong in him. He is the one who was most rich, who became the most poor, so that those who are most poor can find, their, can find themselves most rich in him. And you know, the reason we can receive the Lord's discipline is because He received the Lord's judgment. Because He received the Lord's judgment, we will only ever receive God's discipline. We will never receive His judgment. And in Hebrews, you know, in 5, 7 to 9, it says, During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. He did what no one else has been able to do. He did what none of us have been able to do. While we ran away, he submitted. He submitted to the Lord's judgment. And then it says in verse 8, Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered, and once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. Now we, we have, uh, the Hebrews describes Jesus as our elder brother. As our elder brother. And He has gone before us. He faced the reality of despair, so we'll only face the feeling of despair. And He received the Lord's judgment so that we only receive the Lord's discipline. You know, I remember this, this old movie that you have to be, you have to have been a teenager in the 1990s to appreciate it, but there's a movie called Jojita Vohi Sikandar. It's a Amir Khan movie. And there's an iconic scene in the movie where Amir Khan is in a fight with a bunch of people. He's the younger brother. He's in a fight. He's getting beaten up black and blue. Everybody's uh, just uh, yeah, they, they're tearing him apart. He's got no strength. And somebody runs off to find Amir Khan's elder brother. And there's a scene where Amir Khan's elder brother rushes out of the house and sees what's happening. And then he jumps over this railing, and it's, I think it's in slow motion. But in the in the in the theaters, people would be roaring when they saw the elder brother come. They'll be roaring, and then he comes. The elder brother comes, and he enters the scene, and he does what Bollywood elder brothers do. But see, our elder brother is greater than that. He's better than that, and the reason we can go ahead after what's gone behind us is because we have an elder brother who always, always goes ahead of us. He always goes ahead of us and he will never, never be far from us. And we may, we may be many things in a pandemic. We may be many things in a pandem pandemic, but we are not without his strength. We are not without his love. And we are not without his help. We are not without an elder brother. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this this gift that you have given us to belong to you through your Son, and who has made us equal to Himself, and has given us equal access, equal rights, equal privilege before you. We thank you, Lord, for your Spirit that's given to us, that, that lives in us, and testifies to us, Lord, and reminds us of who we are in Christ. And we pray, Lord, even as we 
come out of this uh, pandemic and go ahead and may face many times, many days where we feel like the psalmist does and we feel like we are without strength. I pray that you'll help us recognize our weakness without condemning ourselves for it. Help us to return to you who is our strength. Help us to receive your discipline. Help us to be sensitive to what you're trying to build in us and what you're trying to kill in us. And more than anything, Lord, help us be remembering always our elder brother who's gone before us, who's experienced the reality of despair so that we'll only ever experience the feeling of it. Who received the Lord's judgment so that we'll only ever receive the Lord's discipline. And who's always with us and always goes ahead of us. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.